order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, August 7th. Recording in progress. There we go. August 7th, uh, 2023. And the first order of business is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Seconded. Okay, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? <coughs> Okay, the agenda is approved. Next is the consent agenda. Uh, we did receive uh, an explanation of Madonna's Earth, which is the um, mural uh, commissioned by uh, Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition, along with Bridgeside Books. Uh, and there's uh, IUD on that, uh, authorizing them to put up display a plaque explaining the <coughs> mural. And, and they're struggling to hear us a little bit online, so I'm just going to put this computer okay. a bit more central. And hopefully that will help. All right. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? I move to approve all consent agenda items. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Just Here. as a point of information, it was War was the lead on the mural. Okay. Um, the location was just by permission of the property owner. All right. I stand uh, corrected. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda is approved. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a uh, public uh, uh, session and is an uh, opportunity for anyone in the public to uh, address anything that is not on the warrant agenda. Anyone, anyone online? Can't see you, so you'll have to speak up. No? Um, if you'll invest me, I'll just note that uh, just a week ago tonight, uh, Chris Lackey of uh, Waterbury Center came before the board to uh, express concern about uh, a uh, alleged arsonist uh, in his neighborhood uh, that was causing disturbances. There was a lot of discussion about the uh, lack of uh, public safety support uh, and uh, we were um, in the unfortunate position of saying that we were doing the best we could, or at least that was my impression. Um, and uh, tonight I'd just like to note that uh, no less than six uh, state police officers went to that household after uh, uh, Mr. Neville uh, had been brought in for observation uh, and released uh, to uh, the care of a responsible adult, in this case uh, his 18-year-old son, uh, and then proceeded to steal his car and go back to his residence uh, and cause further disturbance. And uh, in response, no less than six uh, state police came and spent the entire day uh, protecting the public, making sure that no further damage was caused to his property or others around him. And then when they finally got the uh, warrant from the court at 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, they were able to go in and uh, arrest the offending individual. So uh, I would like to propose to uh, have our town manager write a letter of thanks uh, to uh, the Broad State Police and the uh, Commissioner of Public Safety for the responsiveness of uh, the state police uh, in that situation. Uh, I think there's a lot of times when we complain about public safety issues uh, and uh, probably far too few op uh, opportunities to provide our thanks uh, when they do. So I'd like to do that. At the same time, I'd also like to put on the uh, agenda for our future uh, agenda uh, that we continue to address public safety. Uh, put it in the parking lot for now, for this meeting, and we decide when we're going to bring it back up. I don't know that we found a perfect solution, and I think we need to continue to address what we can do to improve public safety for the residents of Waterbury. Uh, Mike. I just want to personally thank Lisa Scagliotti and the um, staff of the Waterbury Roundabout. The article that she wrote about the 
case the Neville tried to speak up. What? Try to speak up. And speak, <laughs> speak this way and you know she's there. Okay. The the information that she provided uh, in the roundabout about the Neville case I thought was very good to calm the public and telling them letting them know what was happening. And I think that's a you know, if anything, the roundabout is a, a real critical uh, cog in our community to let people know what's going on. So thank you, Lisa, and your staff. There's someone in the room. I'm really sorry. Did you make sure the volume on the computer is all the way up in the lower right? You have to not be in a list room. Okay, I'm just going making sure that uh, people can hear us to the best of our technological ability here. Thanks, Mike, I agree with you, totally. Um, any further discussion on this issue? All right, well, thank you for indulging me on that. Uh, flood response. Are we expecting Tom Drake? Uh, I believe Tom Lights is gonna fill in for Tom Drake. Excuse me, adjust the volume. And then that's another individual. I think people are leaving and coming back to see if the Let's see if there's <coughs> any improvement. So Tom Drake um, has uh, just seven open jobs on the list right now. Um, um, we still got two outstanding DOJ fires for work trying to find them, but we hope to return the ones to Massachusetts this week. Um, for all the supplies, we ordered a pod that'll be here this week. Um, so this room will be free. It's an eight by eight pod. We're just gonna put it in the parking lot out back. Um, so we'll have full use of the steel room again. Um, he thinks his supplies are generally fine. He said the, the conchrobium, which I think is the anti-mold, is getting Correct. low. We'd have to order more of that, but he said, um, Otherwise, he's got adequate supplies, adequate volunteers. And they're still plugging away. Um, but it's getting to be a little more in the least shade, sounds like. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, any questions for Tom? Either Tom? No. OK. Thank you. Um, the Natural Disaster Response Committee Yes, that's me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so last week I asked the select board to consider um, con consider thinking about the creation of a committee that would act as a body to prepare us for and keep us ready for next time for a, another natural disaster. Um, in my and do you want to speak over here? Sure. <laughs> I just, I don't want to say, I do want to pause. I have concerns about the SE group presentation, which I think we will want to have recorded for posterity and just want to make sure that we do our best to find a solution. I'm happy to go get a laptop from home. I didn't have a chance, but uh, I just want to make sure it's, uh, is SE group presenting online? Okay. I know we're all doing the best I can. I'll we'll, we'll be here in person. Okay. Um, I guess we have the camera here, so we can use that recording. Sorry, I'm doing, I'm struggling a little just with the names and everything. All right. Uh, I, I imagine they can hear you better if you speak where I'm sitting. Do you think that's true, John? Yeah. All right. I, I also can speak very loud. Um, all right. So last week, last week, I asked the select board to consider the creation of a committee that would act as a body to prepare us for and keep us prepared for another natural disaster. Um, in a written proposal, which I can move around after I speak from it um, to anyone who's interested. Um, I laid out what the goals of this group might be. Uh, and those are essentially getting the supplies we're going to need and then getting volunteers on a more uh, permanent basis. Um, to keep us prepared for a natural disaster. So essentially, in the event of a natural disaster, these volunteers, like we just experienced, would be deployed. Um, 
and hopefully better trained. Uh, essentially, what they would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis or on a month-to-month -month, or however often they meet is to develop a bedrock and a system using what we'd seen this time and what we've seen during Irene to get Waterbury cleaned up as fast as possible and make sure that the residents of Waterbury are taken care of. Um, if there's any more detail that anyone at this table would like me to go into about the proposal, um, I can say that I reached out to several states and municipalities regarding a essentially volunteer response corps, and some had them. Um, California has one statewide, and they have a portal that you can sign up as a volunteer, and then you are dispatched where you are needed most. Um, Spokane County, County, Washington had their own. Oregon has their own. Colorado has their own. And those are statewide. But I proposed a question to someone I spoke with on the phone from California if we could scale down. Mm -hmm. And they said that would be absolutely possible. And then they said, well, we predominantly experience wildfires. And I was like, well, we experience floods. And they said, we just experienced a flood. And I asked if they wanted to trade notes. Um, so what I gathered was that this has been done before. There is a blueprint for it. And it wouldn't be that hard of an undertaking for just the volunteer corps, um, let alone having a committee to oversee them which I think would make it go a lot easier. It would make things move a lot faster. Um, and then management of a post-disaster relief would be expedited. Do you want to just uh, briefly go over, uh, you've identified a few different teams. Uh, sure. Um, so I can read off the goals of the committee. Goal one, recruit and recommend to the select board a candidate for a natural disaster response coordinator, someone who can and would manage the natural disaster response headquarters or war room like we've been experiencing the past few weeks here in this room um, and various disaster response teams. Two, draft an update to the emergency um, response handbook, things that we didn't use this time that we could maybe uh, update and use. Uh, develop a plan to establish and train a permanent volunteer corps that would be quote unquote activated to prevent a disaster. Uh, I do recognize that this corps, the longer we go without a disaster, will probably shed members and it would be the job of the committee to get more. Um, and then training for volunteers. If we had a leadership system among the volunteers where they were trained to clean up basements and demo drywall and everything we did this time around, but we had someone who knew what they were doing and could tell other people what to do and show them what to do, so everyone's all trained. Um, and then keeping a detailed catalog of volunteers, um, keeping an updated inventory of supplies, um, and then I wrote working with other committees on flood mitigation, but we have this packet that was just done for us uh, about flood mitigation. I feel like that job has been made very easy. Um, the Yes, the acting as teams, essentially, I essentially built a bedrock that could be used. I'm not saying that a committee could use it, but you'd have an initial response team, a team that goes out and assesses the damage after the floodwaters have receded. Um, the team two would be the cleaning team. I mean, I assume that most teams can act in tandem. And then team three would be a human welfare team, which is getting food, potable water, um, disaster relief, FEMA information to victims of a natural disaster. And then outside of all those teams, uh, uh, there's procurement, which I assume the um, procurement of supplies, like what's behind you guys, um, which I assume can be dealt with by the committee themselves and not have to be a separate team in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Mike, I think. Kane did an excellent job. The only thing that I have a little bit of a question, I think we spoke about it, is how the emergency management director falls with, because to me, a lot of this should be the lead of the emergency management director. Sure. Um, and I think having some of these teams are good, but ultimately I think 
you know, you know, we, we have to have someone kind of who's in charge, and if he's the emergency management director has been appointed, how do you, you know, if you have like like kind of a a team here, I know from knowing Gary, he's probably going to just defer to this team, but I think, you know, whoever is going to be, emer whoever is going to be, say, this team lead should probably be considered to be maybe the emergency management director. Sure. I would look at it almost as the way um, our volunteers, uh, Lish Slagle, Alyssa, Danny, right. you know, led the charge on it this time and worked with the emergency management director. Um, essentially, in my mind, it would work the same way. You know, nobody's stepping on each other's toes. Of course, our current emergency management director was out managing emergencies. Right. Well, there were people heading up our headquarters here. Right. Um, so I think the two work in tandem. I don't think, you know, I think one hand washes the other. I don't, I don't think that the emergency management director should necessarily be on this committee um, for the sake of the fact that uh, I just completely lost my train of thought. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that the emergency ma uh, management director should, should be uh, on a volunteer committee. I think they are already in an appointed position with the town and the, and the handbook pretty clearly lays out what they're supposed to be doing. What we don't have is what a post-disaster uh, team looks like, and that's right. essentially what I'm trying to build. So as the emergency managers out managing emergencies, we need to prepare for after right. the emergency is over. Because some of this, each municipality has to have a LEMP, a local emergency management right. plan. We do have an approved local emergency management plan, and somehow, Maybe we need to look to revise that in some way to have this kind of a setup working within that local emergency management plan for large natural, and this is, I think, designed for large natural disasters such as Irene and what we've just had, Irene kind of 2.0. So. Right. So I, I think of it differently, Mike. Okay. Um, the emergency management plan is, is really based on um, a format the state likes to see. It's, it's their yeah. guidance. I think we should have a separate flood management plan, uh, mm -hmm. which, which really goes part and parcel with what Kane is proposing. So mm -hmm. Kane has talked about um, in his proposal um, a lead. I think if we truly want to be prepared, we should have someone always ready to go with an appointment agreement, like a Tom Drake on day one, mm -hmm. um, or perhaps two people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that would be in our flood management plan. And then in the same way we adopt an emergency management plan each year, we could make sure the flood management plan is current. You know, on day one, Bob Butler knew who to call at Casella to get us first in line for dumpsters. He didn't call the 800 number. He knew who to call. That should be in our flood right. management plan. And every year we should refresh that data. Um, so I think of it um, a little differently. I think just yeah. leave the emergency management mm -hmm. plan as is, whether or not To me, I think the two should be married in some way, shape, they, or form. They, they certainly should be, and they would be. But I think, um, but just think keep the emergency management plan in the format the state's used to seeing that they approve and are happy with. And, and <coughs> this is a little different from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the other piece I've thought of, which maybe would be the work of the committee, but um, now that we were all watching the, the elevation of Winooski, and the forecast was two feet lower than what it wound up being, and there was a time in the and they actually revised the forecast downward the day before. And so I think 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we all breathed a sigh of relief because the forecast was revised downward and the curve went like that. So I went home, had dinner, and then got on my phone and it went like that. Um, and I called Gary and he said, well, that was a head fake, wasn't it? Um, so as part of our flood management plan, um, 
I think about river height and forecast river height, and maybe at certain certain points in the forecast, um, not the actual, but the forecast, we just decide to, to pull the pin on certain things, and we say, hey, we're at, we're forecast to be at whatever the number is, 425, go ahead and get those dumpsters ordered, or go ahead and get dehumidifiers mm -hmm. and other things. Um, so, so the emergency management plan is, is more about who's responsible. Right. Um, this would be, I think, more about an action plan, too. I would agree with that. So we're all kind of speaking the same language, just saying it a little bit differently, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think, I think in regards to what Tom is saying, is that <clears throat> established Establishing a committee like this would essentially find that out, figure out where we need to be at certain times as the floodwaters rise, you know. And then as the floodwaters begin to recede, they go into the next phase of the action plan. Uh, and all the while, they have been working at this to whenever the, the next disaster happens. They know exactly what they need to be doing. They know, you know. They know exactly who they're supposed to be managing. They know, they know exactly where the dumpsters are going to be going. They know exactly <clears throat> where we're getting dehumidifiers from. And it would just quicken the, the pace at, of our response. Don't disagree at all. Yeah, but I support it as well. Um, I feel like uh, this essentially acknowledges uh, what happened uh, during the uh, this, this past uh, month. Uh, and. Uh, is really an important way for us to move forward in improving our resilience uh, in response to what previous to last month uh, many of us thought was a once in a lifetime uh, occurrence and now mo many of us are now thinking maybe this is a once every 10 years and maybe we need to think about it happening tonight uh, so uh, you know it's uh, I think it's it's a, a smart the way for us to move forward and improve our uh, our capacity. So, um, and, and you, Tom, you answered one question I also had, which was uh, acknowledging that a, to have a lead person uh, is a huge responsibility on this. Uh, unfortunately, Liz was in a position to step in and take on that charge, right. along with Danny and Alyssa, uh, who. Uh, once again, you know, provided a uh, tremendous amount of uh, effort uh, over the course of two and a half, three weeks, uh, and uh, you know, some of that's continuing even today. Um, but we, I, I don't think it's smart of us to anticipate that there's going to be a volunteer willing to contribute to 24 hours a day for three weeks on end. And I would say that person, as part of the regular planning work, the one way to ensure good work is to pay them. So I think it's going to be a paid position. They're probably going to be paid to go to these meetings and do some of this work. Mm -hmm. um, just the best way to get performance. Yeah, Alyssa. Well, just I support all of it in terms of leveraging volunteers um, and being able to do that more effectively. And what Tom is saying, and I would say, big I completely support it. And to me, it is just working out some of these things about like. We evolved how we evolved, and I think we talked about at the next meeting, like more of a full after action review. I mean, I feel like some of, we talked about even regional folks in different areas of town, and that can be really valuable in terms mm -hmm. of knowing like what's happening in my neighborhood. And um, so some of the volunteers, including some in the room, were really useful at saying like, this is what's happening in this particular reason. Um, I think I have some like minor questions around like, I don't think we need to approve training schedules. I think we do want to think about how this roles coordinator overlaps with what Tom is describing and just general resilience planning. So I think big picture, huge thumbs up, and it's really just about figuring out like what are those specific pieces and acknowledging like we have a volunteer fire department that's incredibly effective and like what are they doing and it's working really well and again just making sure we're supporting and not duplicating. Um, and I think there is a gap. I think we've seen that that's what happened. So there's space for this. Um, but just doing that really intentionally so that everyone involved does know their role. Okay. Uh, Kane, do you need uh, further action from the board uh, at this point? Um, I was just going to ask to, as it's laid out in the proposal, everything says could, right? Nothing is laid out. I fully expected to debate this proposal and come up with some middle ground. Um, so to your questions, Alyssa, it, it does say could. So. 
essentially the way I saw the committee in my mind is we at least get a committee together and then once there's the first committee meeting, you lay out the groundwork and what the committee is going to be doing and it's <coughs> discussed in that capacity. Um, so I guess the further action from the board that I would ask for would be to okay the, at least the creation. We don't have to uh -huh. uh, you know, recruit right this second. I would like the committee on the books so that we can move forward. Like, the only thing I think, the whole plan is really good. The, the one thing I think is that next step is where this is really to get us through the disaster versus, I assume this, this group, it, uh, and maybe let me ask, will this group work on resiliency post, you know, once recovery is sort of happening. I would hope so. Um, That's well, the one thing I was kind of missing in the outline. Yeah, the, I suppose I could have uh, scratched a little more on that. Essentially the way I pictured this committee was that we would forever have some sort of management team who will, like, you know, when the committee members eventually leave and new ones come on, come on the committee, they would be given these guidelines so that you would have a group of folks in town who would always know what to do. Right. And, and I think per Mike's point, I mean, I know in the past, Waterbury had a long-term recovery committee that met right. and did all sorts of things ranging from looking at like, right. FEMA zoning regulations to um, some of the mitigation stuff we're going to talk about later in um, volunteer. So I think if, if we ultimately want it to be one committee, I'm happy to make a motion to endorse creating a natural disaster response committee to more effectively leverage volunteers um, and come back with a proposal. I think we need to be <laughs> practical and intentional about thinking about we're creating three separate flood response committees. Is it one committee and this <coughs> volunteer person the head of that is the one on the long-term committee who that, you know, I'm just recognizing your volunteer, you know, off the street who's here too um, because they really want to help support their neighbors as a volunteer may or may not have an interest in some of the longer-term infrastructure projects, which is totally okay and awesome and just want to make sure we're meeting all their needs. <laughs> all How many members? Who are driving. Um, <laughs> How about uh, we can move forward and recognize that we will create this committee. Uh, I think the scope of work of the committee and the, uh, and the, the size of it may need to be worked out over yeah. the next uh, few weeks. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds sure. Fair. Totally. Okay. Uh, someone wants to make such a motion, we can move forward. I make a motion to approve the creation of the Waterbury Select Board Natural Disaster Response Committee. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We've got ourselves a committee. Uh, the, uh, mission of that committee and its constitution will be developed over the next few weeks. Good job, Kane. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next is uh, mitigation, uh, and I asked Tom to uh, print out a copy of a report that was developed by um, the... Um, Recording stuff. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay. This is a uh, study that was uh, developed by Malone and McBroom, uh, a uh, engineering firm uh, based right here in Waterbury, uh, and they worked uh, with the Little River, um, Little River uh, uh, here. engineering firm, I think, to do a more in-depth hydrological study of uh, the uh, flood during Irene, and then uh, impact points uh, that uh, caused the water to back up. And uh, they came forward with a set of recommendations, uh, one of which was implemented, which was uh, to um, do flood remediation uh, at the uh, state complex, which was accomplished. Uh, and uh, according to some, uh, it did impact uh, the flow of water uh, this last time. Uh, there were 
A couple of other recommendations that were not implemented. Uh, one was uh, to uh, bring the uh, meadow across the river at uh, Harvey Farm down an average of, uh, I think, seven feet across 13 acres. Recording in progress. Good. Um, at a cost of about three and a half million dollars, uh, that plan was presented to the Harveys and to the select board in Duxbury, uh, neither of which endorsed the, the, the program. Um, and it was essentially left there. Uh, one of the things that I wasn't aware of uh, in reading the report uh, this afternoon was the recommendation to uh, take down the uh, about a third of the state cornfield uh, by uh, about five feet um, and uh, create restore more floodplain absorption capacity uh, in that corridor. Uh, as well as the, what used to be called the hayfield, now they're growing corn on it again, um, up above that. Um, and uh, I think the price tag on that was more in the order of $5 million uh, to do all that uh, earthwork. Um, I'm not sure uh, why that wasn't implemented. Cost could be a major component of that. Uh, and maybe members of the audience will know as well. Uh, Maybe but uh, I thought that we should at least take advantage of the hydrological studies that have been done and uh, explore those further uh, as we look at this as being something that may recur more often than we had previously thought. So, I, think, I think it was a cost. Uh -huh. the, the state, they were in the process of what was about a $130 million project to uh, remove buildings at, at the former state complex. There were 49 buildings there. They took down 30 of them or something like that. And then they built the new facility. And as you said, Roger, they did do some uh, mitigation and some regrading of uh, the state complex mm -hmm. proper. Uh, but whatever the price tag was, I think they just figured, well, that was too much. Yeah. We concentrated on the Harvey Farm aspect over here. And I don't remember the, what the report said with regard to the number of inches that all of this combined would reduce the flood by. But I think that's in there. A uh, foot. A foot. And as you all know, who suffered the flood, a foot is a big deal. Yeah. And Foot is a, big, is a big deal. This is a big deal. Okay. Um, and I think now that, you know, in 12 years after Irene, here we go again. Uh, I think that that report has to be, you know, we've got to remind the state about that. And uh, if they're serious about giving floodplains back to the rivers, here's two prime examples of where it can be done. And yeah, it costs money, but how many you know, millions of dollars of damage has been done, not so much in Waterbury this time, but in other places. And if you can do something that's going to reduce future flooding by potentially a foot or more, that's, that's a huge number. Yeah. And uh, again, the reason that uh, I think you and, and others focused on the Harvey Farm is that it really does create a choke point. <laughs> so that even if you do increase the amount of water that can flow down past the, uh, the cornfield, right. it's still going to get blocked there yeah, and the then get backed up. Point, the big choke point was the peninsula basically of the Harvey Farm pushing up against the basically immovable railroad levee. Right. Uh, that, that's not going anywhere, and you can't do anything about that. So I think you're right that um, without the Harvey Farm being uh, considered or, or somehow mitigated there, um, you could lower up here, and it wasn't going to give you, it was, a, it was a combination of things, and this is the choke down mm -hmm. here, right, right there. Right. Okay. Uh, and I'll just say that uh, Tom 
uh, Lights and Tom Drake and I met with Erhard Monka of uh, Senator Sanders' office on Friday. Uh, this was one of the things that we brought up among a few others, uh, flood-related uh, damage and, and the mitigation. Uh, and he's uh, admitted that that's not his area of expertise, but that he was going to see what might be able to be done and that uh, he, uh, the senator, is going to try to get uh, additional uh, disaster assistance specifically for uh, this uh, recent uh, statewide disaster. Uh, and uh, hopefully part of that could be, could address mitigation issues as well as uh, uh, flood relief uh, and recovery. Yes, Mike. Might we want to, I think, I think the whole Harvey Farm project would be a good one. But I also think another possible source that, we, you know, one I'm pretty intimate with is Ducks Unlimited. They're very much in, you know, in wetlands restoration. Mm -hmm. And if we could, you know, use that floodplain, they could, you know, they have a, they're the largest conservation organization in the country. I don't know if it's big enough that they're going to look at it, for, you know, but as much as for production of waterfowl, they look at the wetlands have a benefit for flood protection. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, because how key this is, maybe this is not just in conjunction with just Waterbury, it may be Waterbury, Barry, Montpelier, et cetera, that they could look at a bigger project to yeah. fund. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. something at least we're looking at. Watershed, for example? Yeah. Yeah, come on. The, the study that you were referencing, does it just look at the impacts to Waterbury, or does it consider what happens when you take out a downstream constriction to Richmond, Essex, further downstream? Because you just, you that, that constriction flattens your hydrograph. Mm -hmm. You don't take out that constriction, you're just going to send that peak downstream and impact downriver communities. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, the way they're addressing it is uh, to increase uh, the uh, floodplain absorption. Uh, which, so it's which not. Is, which is good if you add storage, but you don't take out constrictions. You use those constrictions to. Right. To, to, to hold spread. water back and you provide storage upstream for it. Right. Um, I, I, honestly, it seemed to me like a bit of both. And to answer your question directly, no, they don't address impacts downstream. And, and I, I think it was, you know, I forgot what the cost of the study was, but it was, you know, it's not the, the final uh, deal. I mean, it's a preliminary kind of look. And if there was, interest amongst the parties to do more, I'm sure there would be more studies done. I don't think anybody is just going to say, well, this is all there is to say. But um, I think that the, uh, uh, the, the downstream, well, I, I won't get into it. The, there's, a, there's a dam not too far downstream from Harvey's at Bolton. And they looked at the Bolton Dam as well to see if that had been uh, a cause of backing up water. And they really felt that it wasn't, and that there, there was some means to uh, operate that dam a little bit differently. There's no gates at the Bolton Dam. It just, right. you know, it's just a spillover, it just is a spill, spillover dam. But they have, a, there's a kind of a pontoon gate that they, uh, or a pontoon dam that extends the dam a little bit. But there's, there's a lot of uh, information that probably still needs to be gathered. But I think that for Waterbury's sake and Duxbury's sake, these things require additional looking at. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, a few things. Um, The, the, first, the biggest thing is the, you know, we can talk about the local option tax, but that's significant enough revenue that it gives us the option of pursuing some of these projects, even if the state and federal government don't participate. Uh, and allows it allows us to pursue it on our time frame, which sometimes is the biggest challenge here. Getting all these partners in line takes a number of years, 
all the engineering needs to be either refreshed or redone or done for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if you're seeking state and federal partners in a project like this, the first step is investing in the studies on your own, uh, which can easily be a six figures. Yep. So I think about the local option tax. We've talked about it in a lot of contexts, one being affordable housing, but I also think of this challenge and how $600,000 a year is, goes a long way. All right. I don't know if we need any further uh, uh, motion from the board uh, on this, but uh, I think it uh, is We've discussed it. It will be something that we'll continue to take a look at and look at uh, some what options are in front of us, what use we can make of existing studies, uh, and then uh, maybe, as uh, has been alluded to, uh, look at uh, a broader watershed uh, approach to, uh, to this. And Mike, if you want to find any friends in Ducks Unlimited that uh, are willing to uh, join the effort. Uh, to me, this is a big project. You know, it's not just Waterbury. And, but I could, I know a lot of people in Duck, Ducks Unlimited National, and I would see if there's some sort of, you know, impetus. Because I know, I don't know how much in terms of waterfowl it's going to, you know, yes, anytime you restore wetlands, you're going to probably help waterfowl. but. You know, to me, the benefits of creating more wetlands are going to do a, a, a real benefit to flood protection. And I, I, I will do some investigation. I go down there every morning with my dog, and there's always a flock of mergansers and mallards uh, that we come in with. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talk to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, unless there's uh, further discussion on flood uh, recovery, uh, I think we can move on to the next agenda. I don't want to put anything further to discuss. I think yes. long term we should just think about who's owning this work, just recognizing we as a board, our municipal managers and staff have a lot of competing priorities. And again, I don't want to you know, have Kane and I come each week with a new committee proposal, but I just do want to think about how we make sure we're keeping ourselves honest and checking in about getting this done and moving it forward. I think short term, it's top of mind for all of us, just, but just on those multi-year projects, making sure we're keeping it on the radar. Right. Totally and agree. I think maybe we should consider, uh, rather than having six different committees uh, working independently on a larger flood response committee with designated chiefs in certain areas, uh, could be a uh, way to go. Yeah. Okay, we can further define that going forward. All right, let's move on to the SE uh, presentation. Challenges. Which, I actually was trying to There's a PowerPoint, but. Do you want to try connecting to my laptop? I did it's the projector itself, right? You're right. <laughs> so, okay, that's so, good. Let's try. <laughs> Again. Nope, uh, wrong end. Take it out of the gray. Uh, nope, that, that was the owl. That was the owl. That was the owl. Take that back. Okay. Should be able to go old school and go to a slide projector. It's very small. So this is to the projector, right? It's my input. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm it's just, I'm, I'm yes. so yes. 30 yes. minutes early. It's That's still not working. Uh, the, first, the first brand new laptop died completely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or I think it's the projector itself. Yeah. Is it I on? Shut it down a minute ago. Yeah, because the light was on. I tried that. There's no. I think we need a new IT guy. He's been doing with he's been dealing with dumpsters, but we've had we've been trying to fix these issues for months, and I'm ready to yeah. blow it up. Mm -hmm. yeah, I want right. a flat screen TV that we just plug in oh, directly. What, what did, when I was in middle school, and the owl yeah. has given us so many okay, problems. I'm almost yeah. prepared to say the, that we just simply head. don't have a zoom option because it seems to be such a. Let's get one of those. The projectors from high school. Like that. <laughs> oh, the DRB chair is clapping, but that's a sad matter. <laughs> Smart boards, that's what I was thinking of. Smart boards. <laughs> I guess it's a question to Patrick. No, 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 I'll later. I see a lot of parking on a meeting with two crowds. See, you see the view yes. sonic, but that's. 
Oh, there's Wait. something coming. You can turn know, but it's done that. Yeah. It did that during the meeting when I tried to reset it, and then it goes off. What is happening? Oops, it's not the right one. All right. Um, is Patrick okay with that slide? There. I don't know if we, we're getting it. Well, this has been a while. See, it like oh, is yeah. functioning, okay. and yet somehow HDMI so is not. So it's not getting the. Uh, is, is the table not plugged into the ground outlet? Have you tried turning off the projector and turning it on? About three yeah, times. You did okay. Yeah. But thank you. When in doubt, reset. <laughs> yeah, that's about all I can offer. <laughs> well, it might be that really gnarly looking cord. All right, I think we call it as long as Patrick can. Oh, we, have your <laughs> we have copies of. We got a copy right here. You want to just well, that's the presentation. That's not. Oh, the presentation. Point. Yeah. Um. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I guess. Let me do that. You need to try walk around the room. Yeah, but it's not. Oh, this HDMI. is an HMI. Uh, I'll see if there's an HMI. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
one of the things we did first off at the beginning of the project was having a stakeholder committee site walk to get a good feel for all the existing conditions at both Hope Davy and at the ice center. And just hear insights from folks. Um, that went into the, the next stage of visioning. And so we did a community visioning workshop that was held here um, that also included a, uh, an online survey component. And from there, we moved into kind of out of that first as a step before we got in design, developing kind of a preliminary program that then we looked to see how that fit on the site. Uh, so phase three, uh, look at preliminary concepts. Uh, so we developed some preliminary concepts, shared those with the steering committee, and uh, arrived at a preferred concept. And also along the way, developed cost estimates, looked at permitting, um, potential constraints, uh, some of the some of the implementation considerations, and that all got packaged up into a, a master plan document. Um, so that's I think we have some copies of that uh, here, um, and that's what's been submitted to the to the select board for acceptance. Go to the next slide. So just to give you a little bit of information about the community engagement, we have done quite a lot of this along the way to make sure we're hearing uh, the needs and concerns of the local community. Um, so you can see there, number one, that's that site walk I mentioned. Uh, number two, the uh, vision workshop, that's a photo of, of the event. And um, you know, that's just one little piece of how we documented some of the input from the online survey. Um, that's one of the that's the preliminary concept review meeting, and then on to the preferred concept presentation. And here we are today, number six. Move on to the next slide. So I'll start with the ice center area. Go ahead to the next. So this is an existing conditions map, um, looking at some of the constraints and opportunities we had to work with. Um, you'll note that um, the river corridor covers the majority of the site, if not maybe all the site actually. And uh, we have a FEMA flood zone um, as well. There's also prime ag soils. And so we were quite aware of the uh, threat of flooding to this site. And um, yeah, tragically, uh, you know, this major historic flood has since happened before we've even completed this report. And I understand talking to Tom that the floodwaters completely covered the fields and got pretty close to the ice center. Um, so um, we were definitely taking that into consideration from a practical standpoint of making investment and also from a permitting standpoint as well. we'll go on to the next slide. So out of the uh, you know, working with the town, working with the, 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 the committee, and <clears throat> all that public engagement, we developed a purpose and need statement. This is kind of a simplified version of that. Um, so, you know, we're really trying to look at accommodation, accommodate additional uses and activities, um, including uh, increased diversity of recreational needs. And we want to serve the needs of local residents and visitors of all ages and physical abilities, I should mention while meeting the regulatory requirements uh, given the proximity to the Winooski River. And so with those outdoor recreation activities, we want to provide a nice balance of passive recreation uh, opportunities, including gathering resting places, uh, plus access to the river, in addition to some of the more active uses. Um, you know, there has been a skate park committee that's been looking at um, the possibility of a skate park at this site, and so that was something that from the beginning, we knew uh, we'd be looking at. Um, just also from a you know a kind of best practices standpoint, looking at the site circulation and safety. It's a very straight road. Cars sometimes traveling fast on that road, and then always being sensitive to the kind of ecological and cultural resource uh, considerations. And then getting to some more specifics, um, you could consider this essentially a design program of uh, this list of goals. There's a skate park, uh, public restroom facilities, something really lacking there now. Uh, maybe a trail for more uh, passive recreation, improved river access, um, protected or reconstructed 
Huff Track, it's a dirt track for bikes. Uh, safety along River Road, excuse me, adding another soccer field, meet that um, increasing demand, improving car parking capacity, uh, creating gathering spaces and meeting ADA uh, or accessibility requirements, and incorporating visual arts. Some additional goals that were um, considered, integrating bike skills elements, improving the mountain bike kiosk, facilitating space for events, and creating a playground. Next slide. So this is the preferred concept that came out of this process, and I'll show you um, some of the preliminary options uh, that uh, we uh, explored along the way. Um, so just to orient you, the white box um, from the center to the right is the existing ICE Center. And I think the most significant um, improvements that we looked at, um, you know, in terms of where they made the most sense, in terms of uh, kind of adjacencies to other uses, in terms of circulation, is the, the skate park. So that's right here. Um, originally, it had been considered kind of more in this area, um, to the east of the, of the existing dog park. But the main driver for locating that was actually um, the flood risk. And um, Steve, who we worked with throughout this process and was really, really helpful in kind of orchestrating um, some, of the, some of the process and talking to regulators. I mean, you, you spoke to the regional uh, floodplain manager, um, Ned Swanberg, and he provided some really helpful guidance in terms of siting propo proposed infrastructure downstream of existing uh, development, so that really meant pushing things this way, kind of behind it, almost like the shadow of, of the parking lot in the building. Um, so uh, that also allowed us to kind of create a, a node of activity, uh, building off of the existing pump track, which we envisioned potentially getting a little bit of a, a refresh in terms of being a little bit more focused on a prog progressive um, jump lines for bikes, um, and that the skate park could potentially incorporate uh, an asphalt pump track loop around the perimeter of it. I think the way that develops remains to be seen. The dirt uh, pump track could remain just that, and the skate park could be just a straight skate park that uh, doesn't incorporate that element. But we thought it was something interesting to explore. It could kind of uh, provide some unique op opportunities for kids on scooters, kids on skateboards, kids on bikes to use that skate park facility. And then we created this kind of central gathering space with the play area as a, kind of the, the node between those two uses and um, it also uh, directly adjacent to the athletic fields. So we would envision that having the, the public restrooms that were part of that program, having a shade structure, and, and really just providing a nice, very family-friendly gathering space. Um, you know, that could be a place where Family comes with kids, and the parents could hang out in that very centrally located spot, kind of keep an eye on kids that might be doing some of these different activities. Um, could support even maybe some really small events, and could also be a place to showcase some um, public art. Uh, the other improvements are um, a new U12 soccer field, making use of all that open space, um, some additional parking, given the, the, some of those current challenges. We also took the existing parking um, for the Perry Head Trails trailhead out um, of its existing location, which was really um, too close to the river. So to kind of correct that, um, we showed um, the parking remaining on the other side of the road, which is fine. And then uh, you have that small parking area between the skate park and the, and the pump track. But we've also recommended this shared use path kind of connection to this more centralized parking lot. So that distance of, of, of path is really nothing for someone on a mountain biker who's going to be doing an eight mile ride, 12 mile ride um, in this trail network. Uh, let's see, I think those were the main components. Um, you know, just some beautification. Really wanted this to feel more park like. So some street trees along the entrance, and some traffic calming. Um, stormwater treatment uh, for any new impervious and, and for it to be compliant with the three acre rule and um, some screening of some of this kind of back of house um, uh, storage areas. Um, okay, next slide.
So this is an enlargement of that area, that central area with the skate park, the gallery space, um, and a small play area, and then the, the pump track or jump line amenity. Okay, next slide. So we gathered a bunch of images just to kind of give you a sense of um, what, we're, what we've been talking about in the plans. So I'll start with the left, the concrete skate park. The one below that shows the idea of an of a asphalt pump track that could surround the skate park. Skateboarders would, would also use that as well. Progressive jump line on the bottom left. So the idea with that is that you would have a, a few, several lines of jumps of kind of increasing in size to allow um, kids to progress in their jumping skill. I think adults would also enjoy that. Um, and then in the center, I'm showing a couple options for a shade pavilion, something a little bit more um, perhaps unconventional on the top, and then a more traditional structure below that. That could be a bathroom facility on the back side of it with some picnic tables, maybe a mural on that face um, to, to pick up, a, try to uh, capture some public art opportunities. Um, now, in, in play area, we're thinking maybe to just distinguish from some of the other play facilities in Waterbury, that could be a, more of a natural play um, type of facility that using natural wood materials. And then the right soccer field, um, that loop trail for that kind of passive recreation opportunity, interpretive signage, that could be about some of the historic resources, like old building foundation on site, and stormwater management. Next slide. Uh, yeah, the top left, it shows a label correctly, but um, so parking, accessible circulation, maybe some planting improvements, and then um, some of that traffic common that we talked about, and kind of improving that bike pad um, condition on, on the park. Next slide. These were some of the preliminary options, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but just let everyone know we did explore a range of options, some of them a little bit more ambitious. Um, one of them looked at uh, rerouting the existing road coming in so that we could have all the park amenities on one side, kind of really create more of that cohesive uh, pedestrian park space. Um, we ended up abandoning that. I think it had to do with the flood floodplain considerations. There's also major costs associated with that. So, next slide. Steve, can, can, yeah, sure. So, can you just elaborate on the issues with the flood? Because, sure. I mean, I, I'm not officially official anymore, but I, there's one or two people who continually ask me why right. can't the road be moved? So yeah, let me move, move up a little bit. Um, Sure. Um, so excuse my voice. I'm, I'm at the very tail end of pneumonia, so, but I'm not contagious. So. Um, but at any rate, um, Steve Lott's speech, uh, and it's been great working with Patrick. So Patrick mentioned that we have a lot of coordination with Ned Swanberg, who is the floodplain manager that serves this region. And um, the, what's called the river corridor was the big issue that you're referring to, Bill. So the river corridor is different than the floodplain. It's pretty much the, the uh, valley wall, if you will, uh, to valley wall. So it does take in uh, the vast majority of the ice center site. The state has become more and more dedicated to allowing rivers and streams to meander within this river corridor in, in their natural condition. However, when there's existing infrastructure like the ice center, the road into the ice center, um, these types of things, uh, the state will accept <clears throat> defending those structures. So that's, uh, Patrick alluded to the facilities ending up um, essentially downstream of the ice center, um, kind of within the shadow of the ice center, and also between the existing uh, road and the railroad tracks. So when, um, when we reviewed the proposal of moving the existing road with um, Ned Swanberg in particular, he said, well, then you really lose the infrastructure that you're trying to defend because you've moved it. 
and then the state is not really going to support uh, adding <coughs> facilities that, that then the town is going to have to defend from any potential meandering in the river. So we're really looking long term, uh, you know, the short term it's hard to believe the river will meander that far, but it's the principle. So does that help explain? So, so this, in other words, the skate park and the pump park, right. and those things that are between the road and the railroad track now, right. because the road is there, the state will allow the town to defend the road and defend those facilities on the other side of the road between that and the railroad track. But if you move the road and then all those things are on the river side of the road, then you can't do anything to protect them. Correct. They don't support that. And the, you'll notice that the parking, expanded parking, kind of gets tucked between the ice setter and the road. Go back. So maybe you go back to the concept, um, the, the full concept, Tom. Um, yeah, a little, there you go. Perfect. So you can see how the, um, the parking areas that are proposed are essentially between the ice setter and the road. So, you know, our thinking is that we could defend that as in that shadow of the ice town. And you don't have to worry about the soccer field because you No, nice. I mean, it's, it's really the hard, I think, um, I mean, it's obviously an investment, but it's... Yeah, but it, it's just, right. It could, there you know, is. could be lost if necessary, I guess you could say, but that's not a very fair thing to say. But the existing large soccer field is an example that's been flooded a number of times just recently and also during Irene. Okay, well that's fine. That help? Thank you very much. Okay, good. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, well. Okay, move on to Hope Davy Park. <clears throat> just go ahead in the next slide. Uh, so this is the existing conditions map. Um, so this is, you know, I think what's really uh, useful is to see the extent of, of wetlands. Um, so that was matched for this project. You can see, uh, it's hard to see here, but, you know, we have Hope Thatcher Brook with some wetlands along there. There's a vernal pool down here. There's a little drainage through here with the wetland, and there's this large wetland over here that extends off-site. This, this is the boundary of the park. And that side is the more developed kind of sports field side of it. And this is sort of the back wooded area with the disc golf. Um, so go ahead, uh, next slide. Um, so the purpose and need for this one, um, we wanted to look at um, applying principles of ecological and accessible design to creating a, a more sustainable park plan. Um, so part of that is providing safe access to the park's key recreational amenities um, where practical, especially in that more developed portion of it, uh, while protecting the natural setting and habitat function. Um, certainly needs of local residents and neighbors, out-of-town visitors and people of all ages and abilities seeking benefits of active recreation community gathering space and multi-use passive and active recreation in the diverse environment. So it comes some of the themes to the ICE Center with its own special considerations. Um, so part of that is improving the active recreational experiences offered. Um, I think some of that, a lot of that has to do with the, the disc golf and also how it kind of fits in with um, some of the concerns of the site. Making the park more accessible, um, looking at kind of the further enjoyment of the natural areas and, and their an educational um, opportunities there and the ecological health of the park. Next slide. Uh, question for you, yeah. Tom. So your under need, your first and third need are directly competing. So yeah. was there any conversation or at the committee level, Steve, any conversation about, in essence, not trying to balance them, but choose, choose one or the other? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think we're always, and Steve maybe can chime in here, but I think we're always trying to find that nice balance of the two, as well as the, well as the, as well as the ecology, knowing that we're not going to make everyone happy. <laughs> right. 
So I think you know there might be some folks who don't think some activities belong out there, but we're really trying to find that right balance, hearing different inputs from, you know, hearing everyone's voices in the community. I don't know, Steve, if you want to add anything to that, but um, I think balance is really what we are striving for in the plans. I'd also just challenge the premise of your first sentence that they are inherently in conflict, just because mm -hmm. I think, like, particularly on this site, we have more developed areas where we can improve active, I'm just saying, but like, but just taking that face value, you, right. I think you can have more active recreational experiences that are not inherently in contact, in contrast with enjoying the natural areas. I'm not disputing that there are right. some conflicts in some places, but I don't think having both as key needs is always inherently bad. Yeah. After maybe I, I yeah, just um, mentioned that um, one of the key aspects at Hope Davy is that the the um, disc golf course precedes the current wetland rules of the state. So uh, the disc golf course is approximately 20 years old. So started in early 2000s, and the state uh, wetland current wetland rules came in more around 2010. So there's a certain level of um, grandfathering, if you will, with the existing facility. However, um, Patrick, you'll get into some of this yeah. a little later, that uh, any modifications are, are going to require some wetland permitting. So the balance in part is the fact that we have an existing facility that we're trying to improve in terms of its compatibility with natural resources versus um, uh, somehow in a, a conflict that we are creating. It, it's, um, maybe that helps to explain it. And then there was one at one time a, a nature path that was there. And so I think that was some of the impetus was to try to restore that. Um, so that is something we looked at yeah. in showing the plan. The next slide. Um, so getting into kind of more specific program for the park, improving ADA access to the fields, pavilion, and playground, um, expanding the playground. I think there's opportunities for infilling with more playground equipment. Um, expanding parking at the rear of the fire station. As many folks know, use this park. There's kind of overflow area that just ends up being a muddy area that's um, hard to sustain. Uh, improve restroom facilities. There's an existing skate park here as well that's in, in poor condition, and so looking at um, replacing that or upgrading that, um, incorporating visual arts here as well, and then kind of optimizing the basketball court and kind of how, how it relates to that skate park area. So that's for the kind of more developed portion of the park, and then in, in the back area with the disc golf course, um, the idea of creating a passive nature trail. Um, improving the separation or screening um, from the disc golf and the adjacent landowners, establishing ecological protection priorities, um, managing the disc golf amenities to improve the user experience and de uh, decrease conflicts, again being sensitive to the ecology and to the neighbors, um, those considerations, uh, possibly an updated kiosk, uh, wayfinding signage, and um, protection of the of natural features. Next slide. Can I interject for a moment? Yeah, good. Um, was there any talk, committee, or otherwise, um, with the facilities in and around the pavilion, where the pavilion itself um, is falling a little into disarray? And the Chile, the super cool Chilean grill that's, <laughs> that's right outside that pavilion, is uh, being eaten by the earth. <laughs> so I was curious if you guys were looking into improving, essentially because that place is great for barbecues. You yeah, know, people. Sh I seem to recall people doing that before that gr that grill began yeah, giving itself we, back to the land. I didn't observe the grill, that grill uh, okay. happening. But yeah, I mean, I think we didn't get that specific with it, but definitely upgrade the pavilion. It uh, looks like, you know, it's a little worse to wear. Yeah. And use some, use some, at the minimum, fresh coat of paint or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just wondering if that was coming into the plans at all. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, taking a fresh look at that area and the pavilion and um, getting that upgraded is definitely in our recommendations. Um, 
So I'll kind of run through the other stuff in that area. Uh, the, the orange lines are um, proposed paths to provide accessibility to some of these different fields and amenities. Um, that sh shows the expanded parking at that fire station parking area. Um, upgrading the skate park area so we have a safer condition. And even if that other skate park happened at the ice center area, I, you know, I think we still think that this kind of serves that neighborhood function and would be used. So um, we have not uh, recommended just eliminating that completely. Um, just knowing everything is, of course, based on funding. Um, let's see what else. Um, there was just some aesthetic kind of things, like kind of like the pavilion, like the porta potties just kind of sitting out in the open. We thought, you know, doing some kind of enclosure. So that's not the first thing you see when you when you arrive at the park, kind of making that a little bit nicer. There's some kind of low-cost things that could go a long ways to improve things. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then as we get into uh, the wooded area with the disc golf course, we have made a number of recommendations for relocation of tees and baskets um, to try to uh, address some of those ecological concerns as well as concerns with the neighbor. So we're showing um, an expanded setback from the, the property line um, for the tees and baskets. Uh, we're also proposing creating this uh, riparian uh, buffer area along Thatcher Brook, so moving, moving um, some of that uh, more active use further away from the brook um, and just allowing for that more passive recreation activity, maybe a little bit lower impact, to really try to promote the, the habitat in that area. So we did suggest the idea of a, an overlook, the brook. I suppose that kind of thing should be considered with flood risks, and, and I'd be curious to know if anybody was down there, the flooding, to kind of understand how, how far that, that came up. Um, so there are a number of uh, suggested relocations. I think all of it needs to be you know, closely looked at from a design perspective um, to see kind of exactly what makes sense given all the kind of intricacies of the existing conditions. Um, but uh, we are you know, maintaining the, the current 18-hole con configuration or, or number of holes, but um, again, trying to create more of those buffers. So uh, the yellow path is the um, proposed nature trail to allow for that desired passive recreational use. And so we were um, thoughtful in terms of how that related to the existing conditions, uh, both in terms of where the disc golf uh, is happening as well as, well as the uh, wetlands. So we are proposing best management practices um, for all those, uh, for that trail and so boardwalks <coughs> over wetlands um, where those crossings occur. Um, yeah, so really trying to bring, I, I'd say bring the park up to more current standards with um, consideration for the, the wetlands and the ecology. I think that's it. There's also some proposed screening along that border as well. Uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, so we're showing, um, some images that came for some of those recommendations. Improved wayfinding, I think that's both to improve the, the user experience, but also trying to keep people on a more designated trail so they don't wander off, off trail into some of those wetland areas. Um, there could be you know, markers on the trees that constantly reinforce uh, if you're on the right path. Uh, there are opportunities for interpretive signage as well to kind of really promote an understanding and appreciation of the natural resources out there. Uh, wood chip surfacing, that was a recommendation from the arborist to help mitigate um, compaction from that active use. It also helps delineate paths, which is helpful, again, to kind of keep people where you want them. And then that shows a couple examples of um, wooden portable toilet enclosures to kind of improve the aesthetics. Yeah. Why would you use just wood, not portal, you know, portal yeah. of what you see there. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I can see it in state parks, you know, wooden, you know, you lose and stuff like that instead of, you know, because that looks like something you have to move in, move out, where it's a more permanent kind of structure 
that just needs some, some maintenance, as you see there, probably a composting toilet. You could certainly do that. That would be a bigger investment. So I think we were, it wasn't something we heard a lot from the community. So it wasn't like high on the list. It was more than that. Would it be that much more than, than what I see on, on the left? The other thing looks like just, I guess, so a lattice kind of thing. Yeah, that one's a little bit the there, there are some like uh, that, I think out on South Hero, um, <coughs> there's that facility there where they have a more yep. robust structure, but it is just portlets in there. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, so I think the design of that could be okay, a little bit more. Because yeah, I was just going to say, if you have a portal, like you have a, a maintenance, more of a maintenance issue. Than something Correct, like but those, those, those porta bodies aren't off in the woods. They're right there next to the pavilion. Right. I don't think it's a huge deal to move them in and out. <coughs> but some of them are kind of farther away. Well, um, the two, I think, are yeah. just at the parking areas, right? Yeah. yeah. I, think it's, awesome. I think it's pretty easy for an access. Every fall. Every fall. It's yeah. a pretty easy right. from an access standpoint. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, you could certainly go to a more permanent bathroom facility, but I think yes. cost-wise, I don't know if it's justified at this point. Because we the ones by the baseball field. Yeah. I think at the at the ice center area, it seemed a little bit more. Um, there was more interest in that, having a more permanent facility. Yep. To hook up to the sewer system. Yeah. Right. You got a sewer system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Next slide. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'm happy to answer any questions. If I can. Any questions from the board? How about from the committee? Well, the committee uh, passed a motion at our meeting last Thursday to recommend this draft of the study to the select board. Uh, the committee is fully behind this. Um, as you know, there's been Plenty of controversy about uh, certain aspects, especially at, at OPA, but uh, I think we're solidly behind the 18-hole um, disc golf, behind the various improvements to the, the front part. Um, I think we really see this as a, um, a work in progress in terms of some of the implementation, um, that it will take further work with the um, the disc golf group and um, getting some expertise to really refine changes to the disc golf course. So uh, that's one major piece. Certainly at the um, area around the ice center, we'd love to see a name for that park. And uh, we'd like the select board to think about a process to have a, a formal park. I think it deserves uh, an identity other than just associated with the ice center. So I just put my um, two cents in for that. There were, there were a lot of suggestions in the survey, some, some, uh, some very good ones. So that could be a starting point. Um, certainly the skate park group for the uh, ice center is very active and uh, want to continue engaging with, with that group. The arts group in town is very interested in promoting um, visual arts, other arts in both parks, so I think there, um, there's a real interest and in, um, uh, desire to uh, incorporate the arts into uh, both parks along with interpretive uh, exhibits and wayfinding and so on. So I think um, this is really seen as a, a, a basic roadmap and um, we would like to get the endorsement of the select board for the study, whether it's uh, tonight or in a future meeting, if you feel you need more time to really go through and digest it, uh, that's fine. But uh, we really would like to see it um, adopted in concept or endorsed in concept. So that's something that the steering committee also um, supports. I think you've done a great job, uh, both the SE group uh, and the committee, of uh, engaging the public, getting a lot of input, uh, incorporating it into your plan. Uh, and I think uh, it does serve as a great conceptual guide for moving forward uh, for both those properties. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, Bill. Steve, um, it, it appears that you know this could be done in phases. Was there any yeah. discussion amongst the committee about what the priorities are? I mean, is the disc golf the biggest priority? Is the, so was there any discussion about uh, the priority, you know, what comes first? Sure. So I think at Hope Davy Park, the two priorities that, um, that I heard are the improvements to the disc golf course, uh, adjusting the holes, um, you know, uh, moving out of uh, the area along Thatcher Brook. Those are outlined in the study. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, the ADA, ADA access. Um, there were a lot of kudos to uh, Tom for having an, uh, a stone uh, path built to the shelter, which once existed and has um, long since turned to grass. That's been reestablished. I think some additional ADA access, some overflow parking uh, beyond the um, area of the uh, fire station. So I think that's a priority there. I think for the ice center, um, it's more complex because um, the, the two projects that really are the highest priority, I think, are the skate park and an additional youth field for um, soccer. And those two um, really need to go, I feel, in, in concert with each other because of all the floodplain issues. Because there has to be balance, cut, and fill. And they're both within the floodplain. So I really see those two projects and those two groups uh, working together, I think there needs to be some engineering, there needs to be further cost estimating, and I think both groups are very dedicated, Tammy's here of course for the skate park group, very dedicated to fundraising, significant fundraising. So, um, and there are funding opportunities that are outlined in the study where some of the private funding could be used to leverage some uh, possible public funds and really minimize the impact on the town budget in terms of uh, tax rate implication. So I think that's important to keep in mind. But I really see those as the main priorities, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Yeah, a few, uh, a few words here. At the Ice Center, um, I'll actually be out there with Capital Soccer next week. Capital Soccer has a long-term lease on the full-size soccer field there. Um, it's covered in silt. So we're going to meet with them and, and Public Works and see how much work it's going to take to repair it. Um, but I'm also going to ask the question about the next soccer field and if we're there with it. And I don't have any true understanding of what it takes to build a soccer field. Um, but if we're out there with heavy equipment, um, with the hopes that they can use that field in the spring, maybe we can have a conversation about the second field too. Um, it doesn't strike me as a lot of work to build a soccer field, but I truly don't know. Um, the um, as part of moving on to Hope Davy, as part of that, um, we will submit a grant that we got authorized a few weeks back to work on the ADA pass. Um, we'll have the results of that grant by the time we work on our budget. So um, if we get funded, we can hopefully go pretty far on that pretty quick. Um, on the disc golf, I like the idea of, of some of the whole realignment here. Um, I also put a proposal to the Recreation Committee um, in talking with some of the neighbors about maybe establishing some hours for the disc golf course. Um, one of the neighbors, I didn't, I didn't and that, that Recreation Committee meeting was canceled because of the flood. Um, talked to a neighbor recently who told me an interesting story. He said he, he lived in uh, Colorado. Um, and he lived near some, some multi-use paths. Um, for years, they were essentially hiking paths, but mountain biking grew in popularity, and there was a lot, and a lot of conflicts developed um, because of that. And I said, well, was there a solution? He said, yeah, the solution was alternating days. Hmm. So I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to, to talk about, and maybe there's a way to reestablish a nature trail and, and give a quiet period by alternating days between that and disc golf. Um, so those things can be talked about. In the meantime, I like the concepts of, of realigning the holes here, um, which I think effectively addresses some of the wetlands issues. <clears throat> the other piece that's a little bit beyond this and a little more long term, I just want to raise because I'm I'm developing this and I want to talk to Katarina about it and, and give it some time, possibly a couple years. But 
the feeling I'm getting about our parks is that we uh, we have demand for more soccer fields, particularly the full-size fields, which we don't have. Um, and the only potential way to accommodate that would be to cannibalize baseball fields. And at least in year one, it, it appears to me that um, that's not an unrational thing to think about, given the use of the fields that I see. Uh, I'm not prepared to make any recommendation, but <laughs> my, my feeling into the first year is that soccer's growing, baseball's not growing as much, we're not growing at all. Um, and what I hear from the soccer organizations is they'd love to have another full-size soccer field, which we've got one at the Ice Center um, and one down here and I think three or four youth fields. Mm -hmm. Is so that full size soccer field like a regulation size? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wasn't a soccer player, full size, I don't know what exactly you call it, but yeah, we're same language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want to toss that out there because it's becoming a conversation internally. Mm -hmm. Good. I was a little confused about the uh, balance between the um, existing uh, skate park uh, uh, behind the fire station on Maple Street and uh, the, um, uh, the the basketball court there uh, and uh, so our initial uh, recommendation just to dismantle the uh, current uh, skate park because it is in disrepair and potentially dangerous. It's very dangerous. Um, and so I don't know if you can, anybody on the committee or uh, Patrick, you could clarify what the recommendation is on that because it does seem like that could also be a, a fairly reasonably priced uh, short term outcome. Yeah, I mean, Tammy, I don't know if you want well, to comment on that first. That. So it says uh, uh, repair and replace. Uh, um, we heard from a lot of the uh, center. Library Center folk, and the, uh, it, that center skate park gets used tremendously. There's mm -hmm. no other really skate park around the area, so it's very high use. Mm -hmm. We know it's in disrepair. We're actually meeting there tomorrow night to go over it and look at it. We just was were offered um, a brand new ramp, um, so we need to figure out uh, the logistics of this mantling the one that's in disrepair, dismantling the new one, moving and doing all of that, and, um, and talking with the town about doing that as well. <clears throat> in, in the bigger picture, we'd like to see a bit more separation between the skate park and the basketball courts mm -hmm. for safety reasons. Um, not proposing the basketball courts go away at all, but we're looking into doing up a sketch plan, so to speak, to propose to show that there is enough room to have that happen. So that's the plan. So tomorrow night's a big meeting to, to do that, actually. And when you say we, that's the skate park? Excuse right? me, the skate park coalition. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are you meeting at the skate park? We are. What time? Uh, 6.30. I'll pop back. And if it's rainy, we're hoping to go under the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> like, a question for Tom. What is our liability for, um, you know, because I'm not saying skateboarding is really dangerous. I would recommend it. Not for me, but for, you know, you know, if I was, you know, 13 years old again, I'd probably be right, right there shredding it up, but... Hmm. It can, it can create injuries, and how does the town deal with that if it's going to be Are we liable for That was, uh, when I was growing up, my skate park was skated at your own risk. You get hurt. Well, I know, but we're in a litigious society now. Just no to interject, if you look at studies, skate park is kind of low on the list yeah. with regard to um, the bigger injuries of this oh, compared sort. to like skiing and stuff like that? No, comparing to a lot of other uh, head injuries, like with soccer and, and other sports that happen, it's actually not as high as you think. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked with the select board about that when the coalition first started I, this, I remember this that. idea. The answer is, um, 
in theory, there's some liability and risk for any activities right. in the parks. There's no more liability for a skate park right. viewed by our insurer than there is for people playing soccer or baseball. Right. There's all kinds of things you right. can be. The key is to, to keep the facility in good, good repair. Yeah, I think yeah. that's where you get in trouble if you have something that has an unpredictable risk. You know, like something breaking while you're in it, or something jab, jabbing out. You know, I think that's more of a liability issue than a, a well-designed. But like Sandy was part. saying, like one of the ramps are in Bishop Pass. Yeah, that's yeah. That kind of the thing. actual ramp material on the top is in great shape. It's the foundation. All the wood underneath mm -hmm. is rotting now, <clears throat> so there's nothing for to. Uh, like we, to band-aid it, we can't put more nails or screws. There's nothing to uh, grab it. In. That's kind of what sparked my is, you know, if we have something that's in disrepair, you know, we're probably a lot more liable than if we have, you know, stuff that's up to date. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to thank Patrick and the committee for uh, all the work that you put into this over the past year and a half. Uh, it's really uh, been, I think, a tremendous effort. Um, do I have a motion? I, have a, I make a motion to approve the uh, Waterbury, Hope Davy, and Ice Center Area Parks Master Plan. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The, uh, thank you. Great. Thank, thanks for your right. support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, everyone. Yep, thank you, Patrick. And participation. We want to uh, address the issue of abatements. I know we just stop share so we can see our plans. Abatements uh, were a big deal uh, after Irene, where many people uh, were uh, had to be evacuated from their houses or evacuated themselves from their houses for a period of months. Uh, not so much this time, but uh, perhaps you can just uh, give us an overview of the situation as you see it. Uh, as it stands now, we have one abatement request formally. Um, we also informally have a couple of phone calls about it. We've also got a couple of phone calls about buyouts. Um, and just to give a, a little layer, to, another layer to it, um, Dan Sweet, our lister, uh, so would not impact this year, but future years, has the ability um, to apply depreciation to properties. Um, and that was done in a pretty substantial way after Irene. Um, <coughs> I believe um, it started relatively small, and at one point it peaked about 30% for the, for the flood impacted areas. Um, and that was based not just on who was flooded, but the flood maps. Mm -hmm. And then that depreciation over the, over the years was removed because the market did not, uh, did not distinguish between properties in the flood zone and properties out of the flood zone. Um, Dan is, is researching that now going forward and, and going to take a, a, a close look at that. Um, the challenge with that is um, you know, we have something in the neighborhood of a couple hundred impact, flood impacted properties. So if depreciation is applied to them, um, that's effectively reducing the grand list. If your property was valued at $200,000 and 10% depreciation is applied, you're valued less. So um, that's effectively paid for by everyone else. Um, what I don't understand in full yet is how that also impacts the education tax rate given we're in a broader district. So I'm trying to trying to answer that. But first, um, what I said to Dan is there's, there's time for all that because that's the 2024 grand list. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really up to him as a professional to, to do that analysis and try to figure out the appropriate number for, mm -hmm. um, based on the market. He's also going to talk to other communities that were flood impacted to, to get their thoughts and see what, what they're planning. Um, <coughs> so it's, truth be told, it's part art and part science, but, I, but Dan's job is to make it far more science than art in the end. Um, so I'm going to rely on his experience and his professionalism to to treat those properties appropriately, but it's going to have some impact on the grand list next year. Okay. And would it be too soon to ask him to come in here on the 21st uh, to uh, give us an overview of how he's approaching it? Yeah, I think it will be, but I think it, it doesn't need to wait three months. I think it can be in September. Okay. And uh, how about a response to this? Uh, what's the timeline for a response on this request that we've already received? It's. Uh, BCA meeting. Uh huh. 
And what, I'm, I'm just, uh, when do we need to uh, set a timeline for that uh, VCA meeting? Excuse me. Um, I don't I can recall if there's a legal deadline. I think the answer is as soon as we reasonably can. Okay. I mean, well, our taxes is due this week. Tax, the first round of installments is due, um, and therein lies the challenge. Well, just, mm -hmm. isn't there something about what we can or can't leave <coughs> late fees? So in short, if we don't take action by this week, then in theory, late fees would apply, unless we have the ability to do that. I'm just saying that for a right. right, but that's unlikely time to have a meeting. There's also a second installment. Sure. Ron. Yeah. Um, I meant to talk about this with Tom before. This this just may be helpful information for you. This is what we did in Irene. And Tom's exactly right. Um, you know, you have to remember that grand list is lodged in, uh, on April 1st. It tries to explain, I mean, the, um, the assessor lists the value of your property as of April 1st, and that's what your tax bill for this year is based on. And just like if you have a fire, if there's a flood, you might, you might decide that um, you know, they don't have the use of their property. But this, this table is what we ended up doing in Irene. And you can see down at the bottom, kind of a, almost all the way to the end, uh, $92,728 uh, were abated in taxes. And that was the town and the village and the education taxes. But what's important to note here is if you look like a third of the way over, you see a column that says number of days out. Mm -hmm. That's really what we did in, in 2011 to determine how we were going to abate taxes. And this time around, nobody's out. So you could make an argument that on April 1st, when the taxes were assessed, when, uh, when Tom set the grand list uh, based on what was on the ground on April 1st, that was what your property was worth, and that's what you pay for taxes. And very few people this time have really lost the ability to to use their property. There's hardly anybody that I know of that had to leave their property. I mean, Roger, you were, if you look on this list, you know, you look like you were out for 111 days. Uh, at least yeah, that's how we, how we calculated it. Uh, there's some that were out 216 days here. So uh, what we did was say April 1st to March 31st. So if you were out from you know, the 1st of September until April 1st of next year, we counted every one of those days and said you were out. And all we did was took, in your case, 111 days, divided it by 365 days, and you were out 30% of the year, mm -hmm. and we abated 30% of your taxes. And that's what we did then. And then the next year, you can see way over on the, on the right side about Four, row, four columns in, the assessor's percent of damages. So Tom Vickery at the time went through and said, okay, the alchemist, 50% of their property is damaged. And that was taken care of in the following year. On April 1st, the next year, he lowered uh, assessments. Mm -hmm. So the 2012 taxes, people who had serious damage or minimal damage to their property, and there's somebody on here that was 8%. So um, that might be a, a way that you can approach this. And in the, the, the case that nobody's out of their home, really, to speak of, uh, mostly basements were impacted. Um, and I've never been flooded to, I've had plenty of floods in my own house, but not, not like this. Um, you know, the, the cleanup damages, that's not really your property damage. That's just you have an expense to pump the place out, to get the mud out of there. Um, and, and, you know, the sheetrock and things like that on the, on the first floor, those were the things that caused people to be out the last time. So 
I'm not telling you that you shouldn't abate any taxes now, but I just wanted you to know how we did it in 2011. And I think this time around, Tom's absolutely correct that, that Dan, Dan Sweet, is going to have to kind of look at, okay, um, not only is he going to have to look at how much damage was caused to the property and depreciation, but if, if uh, sale prices start going down in these areas, he's going to have to take that into consideration. So I just wanted you to know that when we abated these $93,000 worth of taxes, it was basically based on how many days out of your property that you were, that you couldn't live in your house anymore. So just for your information, you can do with it what you want. But, and the um, challenge this time is based on that legal criteria. Um, there aren't many people who would qualify. that would qualify. There could be commercial properties that would qualify, per se, under that. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are commercial <coughs> properties on this list. I mean, the Optimist uh -huh. almost a lot of them. You moved back in in December? Yeah, it was very nice. Yeah, got the wood stuff uh, going, very cozy. And Dan Sweet is meeting with the listers next week about the future grand list and, and how to get to that, um, mm -hmm. how to get to those numbers. Um, but it's a very different scenario. Right. We are in a position of having to make a decision, at least one decision, uh, and probably others as well. Um, so, um, just wondering what the consensus might be about getting uh, the uh, Board of Civil Authority to convene uh, on this. Dan, as the lister, in a lot of respects, is a staff to that board, so we need to have him, I'll work with him and reach out and try to convene a meeting as soon as we can. Yes, I think that that's probably the best. And we don't have to address all the issues that uh, Bill just uh, described, but there are a few immediate ones uh, yeah. where we, people deserve I mean, answers. They're requesting you have to hold a hearing. Exactly. Liz Schlegel, I think, is still the chairperson of the DCA. Mm -hmm. and, She's on vacation. And Karen is also on vacation for three weeks, so you've got two key people not here. So. To give you a flavor of the conversations I've had, a couple of property owners call me who own rental properties and say they have no real intention of renovating them. Mm -hmm. And they probably seek an abatement. And I said, well, if it's uninhabitable because you've done nothing to make it re-inhabitable, I'm not sure that's the strongest argument to make to the BCA. Right. Um, yes, and I simply gave them the legal criteria yeah. that the BCA is <laughs> judges by. Yep. Melissa. This is adjacent, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but you mentioned the FEMA buyouts, and I just want to say I saw the email from the thing, and it did mention that it was based on assessed value, and I know we're way below common level of appraisal. Do we know if there's any recourse for that? Or I believe it's appraised value. Okay, appraised. So. Pre-flood. Okay, thank you. Um, It'll be different. And we're, we're digging into what that means. And essentially what I understand it means is that um, the structure is, in essence, knocked down. The, the, the property is returned to green space. Right. Um, I haven't gotten a clear answer, but presumably with municipal ownership after the fact. Usually. Mm -hmm. And then it all takes um, quite a bit of time, obviously. Yeah. No, I just was wondering. I, I mean, I know we, for a variety of reasons, haven't been able to do the reappraisal, but I was wondering if there was downstream impacts of that, recognizing it's a statewide problem, not just ours. But it sounds like that's not being used. I don't believe so. Thank you. OK. I'm not sure we need to take any further action at this point. Uh, we're going to try to work and get this hearing scheduled as soon as possible, given that we've got one of the key individuals uh, out on vacation right now and uh, still working on uh, how this is going to be approached from a listener's point of view. So all we're doing for action is compelling the BCA to convene eventually? Uh, at the soon as practicable. Uh, okay. Opportunity. It's a time when Zoom might be wildly useful, I'm just saying. 
Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I gave you this was just because I think it can be used as precedent. This is what this town did when we had a flood before. And critically, for abatements, we didn't worry about whether somebody had $25,000 worth of damage or $100,000 worth of damage. It was how long could they not use their property that was assessed on April 1st as being of a particular value. So we gave them the time out. The, the damages to the facility got taken care of and was dealt with in the, the, following the, re year. the uh, reassessment in the following year for the, the next April 1st when right. you know Tom Vickery at the time went out and said, okay, Mike's property was worth $200,000. He had, uh, you know, $150,000 worth of damage, and you know he's put it all back. But you know, people aren't going to buy that house for the $200,000 now. So it got re reappraised the next mm -hmm. year. So it's just a, again, not to tell you that don't abate properties, but I just wanted you to know what we did, and it was the timeout that was critical, and the the damages that happened and the impact of that on the property values was picked up in the next year's uh, grant list. Thanks for that uh, clarification. Yes. Can I just but, a follow up to what Bill just said? I don't think we have very many residences that, as he portrayed, you know, were un uninhabitable, but there were businesses that lost a, a percent of business time as a result of the flood. Would that be something I assume that would be? Yeah, that they're, that they're in here. Yeah. So, you know, the, right. the sporting goods store down there. Right, you know, the, right. Waterbury Sports, uh, the, mm -hmm. the Pro Pig, the Pro Pig, the Pro -Pig. Pro -Pig. Yeah. those places. There's a number. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you have to be careful because the, the sporting goods store, they're a tenant. They don't own the building. They don't pay the taxes directly. The same thing with the pro pig. So right. you've got you've got to factor that in as well, you know. So just same you know. thing with renters. There's renters who are out who do not own the building, right. but they right. are not no longer renting in the building. Right. So because did, of flooding. Uh, yeah. did the owner of the property suffer any you know, I mean he's are they withholding rent or something like that because yeah. of lack so, of use? You know, uh, Chad Rich, who owns the, the Pro Pig building, you know, did he suffer any losses? Obviously, there's equipment in there, business equipment that was damaged, but we don't, no, no, don't know if that's no, real no. estate or not. We don't tax, you know, most most uh, business property. So right. anyway, there's lots of wrinkles, but. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Bill, we appreciate your perspective on this. It is helpful to get. Uh, well, what, what the historical precedent is on this and uh, gives us uh, a better perspective uh, on which to make decisions. Uh, unless there's further need to discuss, I think we'll move on. Uh, recognition of municipal staff for flood recovery efforts. Uh, as I uh, explained to you uh, individually, um, we had a meeting uh, with EFUD, uh, and uh, both uh, the chair of EFUD and I expressed interest in uh, recognizing and providing some remuneration to uh, municipal uh, staff uh, for the uh, extra time and effort that they put in during the flood recovery effort. Um, and uh, we can discuss this. I was looking for a motion from the board uh, to allow Tom to uh, make uh, what he considers a fair adjustment to salaries uh, uh, and, uh, in terms of a bonus uh, to uh, make that meaningful. I move to financially compensate the employees of the town for their work during the flood made at Tom's discretion. Does that work? Authorize the municipal manager to yes. Is that going to be because I'm I'm sure they're paid. You know, if they were overtime, but I assume this is just 
bonuses that we're talking about for extra work. Yes. Not yes. Not time served. Yes. Um, and I just want to say we're specific, specifically exempting uh, by his own request uh, our municipal manager for this motion. Okay. Uh, and the other piece I want to add is um, Bill Woodruff is a, is a huge part of it all, and he's salaried. So, so getting him uh, some recognition, I think, is really important. Yeah. Is, is there any way that we could do it to exempt them from taxes and, and payment for them? No. No. <laughs> just ask. <laughs> I didn't think, I thought I would not be the answer. I just give them more. Right. So, you know, we could make up for the taxes. There is, there is no way around taxes. All right. Yeah. Definitely taxes. I would, while we're in discussion, um, like to not only after having made the motion, um, but like to ex extend my thanks to all the town employees who pulled more than just their own weight during our flood. And I think if you see them on the street, give them shake their hand mm -hmm. because they worked harder than any of us did combined. <laughs> like, they worked super hard. Bill Woodruff definitely was pulling more than his own weight. Here, here. Yeah, Bill. Um, Bill has a very, uh, he's very mild mannered, very understated, mm -hmm. um, and so when he tells me there's a problem, <laughs> there's a problem. A great example is the water line break we had at Howard Ave. Um, he texted me nine o'clock at night, and he said there's a break. We've been looking for it for three hours, and we can't find it. You know, we're losing. And I forget the text, but it's like 10,000 gallons a minute, not a big deal. And so I immediately do 10,000 gallons times, you know. And, we're, and I'm like, well, we're losing, you know, a man and a half gallons a day here. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we're, you know, the queer well's running low. Um, that, that's Bill. That's just how he is. Um, so during the flood, Bill said, you know, we might have a problem with the lagoon walls at our wastewater plant. I knew there was a problem. I knew there was a real risk. <laughs> that's just how he is. Um, but but uh, during... During an incident like this, I really just appreciate the fact that um, that calmness comes through and, and, and everyone, I think, benefits from that and doesn't overreact um, and his experience and his work ethic. Can we also, I know I'm sensitive to em employees and rewarding them, as well as giving them some, a little extra in the pocket. Can we give them like a day, an extra day off yeah, and I do that from time to time. You know, something, you know, like that. I know that's also taxed and stuff like that, but, you know, it shows your pre- and sometimes people, the time off is worth more than the money. Yeah. And then there's always the pancakes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Who's in the pancakes? All right. You'll be there this year. I can't wait for pancakes. No, I can't. You can cook some. That was Tom's welcome to Waterbury package for some pancakes. Yeah. All right, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, Tom, you are duly delegated to uh, those uh, okay. adjustments. Thank you. All right, uh, next meeting's agenda is the 21st. Once again, Karen will not be with us. I found our one from last meeting, and we okay. wrote that the public works update and Katerina intro should be moved to the 21st. Does that still stand? It <laughs> should stand. Um, presentation of the financials by the auditors. Right. Oh, yeah. What's the other one you mentioned, Melissa? Public Works Update. Okay. And then we had Were we going else. to try to do lessons learned? <coughs> yep. We had, we, so also, so sorry, that was from the things that didn't make tonight's agenda. Then on the previously drafted Monday 21st yep. one was presentation on charter to the public. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was a public work audit and then flood response. Um, we could do after action, we could do follow-up on committee, we could do standard updates, we yeah. could do whatever we see fit. Yeah. 
for the follow-up. Okay, follow up on that, and let's, can we do after action? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Review. And as previously noted, I may, I'll probably be on Zoom, but it'll still look good. Like I, 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 I might, I might <laughs> hop on over here. <laughs> I might be on drugs and I <laughs> because of pain. And on the charter, to give uh, people a timeline. We assumed that there's a charter vote this year would be November. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a traditional election day. Yep. Um, so if there is to be a charter vote in November, um, the legal process for, for warning, um, public hearings, et cetera, is 70 days before. Um, so we're, <coughs> we've got plenty of time, um, but we're, we're looking back 70 days, so. That's coming up. <coughs> yeah, it's coming up. Uh, close to the end of the month, right? Mm. Uh, yes. And then September. Yeah. Sorry, end of October. No, no we're going to vote. Sorry. We're sorry. going to vote in November, yeah. We're going to vote September. the first week of November. <coughs> Go back seven, seven. days. Right, for Year end of August. Seven. End of August. So, um, good, good time to bring that up. I was just going to say, um, yeah. and I would defer to you and Tom on ordering, but I am wondering about said presentation if we want it to be intentionally first or intentionally at a specific time and again would defer to the judgment of you two of that but um, or we just put it at eight like we did with like se group tonight yeah. but yeah i don't mind having a date I, I think uh perhaps wrapping up uh, some of the flood uh, stuff because it's more top of mind might come first but uh, I'm open to other recommendations. Yeah. I don't think 8 o'clock is too late. Just so we don't all float away. Turn into pumpkins. Pumpkins. But, um, yeah. yeah, any other recommendations? Uh, I'll work with Tom on setting times for all these and uh, getting a uh, draft agenda out uh, by Friday. And yeah. I'm about to talk about zoning, which does not need to be the 21st, but maybe in September. I think both us checking in on the you know planning commission is meeting tonight and just making sure we're on board with what they're moving forward with. As far as I know, the planning commission is meeting every Monday night. Right. Uh, forward, so. so that point being taken, I just want to make sure we're doing our side of the homework. And then, then there's also a piece around compliance that I've heard about that I think we should discuss, but does not need to be the 21st, just saying out loud. I don't. If it's just identifying what homework we should be doing in order to prepare for our meeting, I think it would be great to put it on the agenda. All right, let's do it. What's your plan? I'm, uh, what should it be? Unified. UDP section one, oh God. Um, bylaw rewrite update and proposed timing. I can ask if Martha wants to come or wants me to do it. And uh, with your uh, agreement, I will add uh, public safety to the parking lot so that we can yeah. pull that forward. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to. October. We're gonna, yeah. We're going to be looking at uh, this, the next iteration of our contract with the uh, right. Los State Police. In the future, I don't know exactly how quickly, but. Right. And that's just the public safety is going in the parking lot. It's not going in the agenda. No, we'll go on the agenda for next. Uh, All right. Next slide. Okay. Any further discuss? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Move second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any questions? We are adjourned.